Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, February 9, 2024. Vice President Kamala Harris calls the special counsel's report on President Joe Biden's handling of classified documents gratuitous and politically motivated, referring to the parts that call President Biden an elderly man with a poor memory. Coming up, we'll hear from the vice president and also from Ian Sams, a spokesperson for the White House Counsel's Office. President Biden today hosting German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the White House as the U.S. Senate slowly works through a $95 billion aid package for Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. Opposition from some senators means possible weekend sessions to get to final passage. And in campaign 2024, former Republican Maryland Governor Larry Hogan announces he's running for U.S. Senate. Donald Trump celebrates victory in the Nevada Republican Presidential Caucus. And Nikki Haley talks about what's next in her run for the Republican presidential nomination. Plus, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas on security for Super Bowl 58 this Sunday in Las Vegas. Story from the New York Times. The decision on Thursday not to file criminal charges against President Biden for mishandling classified documents should have been an unequivocal legal exoneration. Instead, it was a political disaster. The investigation into Mr. Biden's handling of the documents after being vice president concluded that he was a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory and had diminished faculties in advancing age. Such startling assertions that they prompted a fiery and emotional attempt at political damage control from the president within hours. Speaking to the cameras from the diplomatic reception room at the White House, Mr. Biden on Thursday evening blasted the report by Robert K. Hur, the special counsel, accusing the report's authors of extraneous commentary about his age and mental capacity. That was reporting from the New York Times. Another line from President Biden Thursday night, my memory is fine. I'm the most qualified person in this country to be president of the United States and finish the job I started. U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, releasing a joint statement with the House Majority Leader and Conference Chair that has this line, a man too incapable of being held accountable for mishandling classified information is certainly unfit for the Oval Office. Today, a reporter asked Vice President Kamala Harris about the special counsel's report. I'm glad you asked. Um... Listen, I have been privileged and proud to serve as Vice President of the United States with Joe Biden as President of the United States. And what I saw of that report last night, I believe is, as a former prosecutor, um, the comments that were made by that prosecutor, gratuitous, inaccurate, and inappropriate. October 7th, Israel experienced a horrific attack. And I will tell you, we got the calls, the president and myself, in the hours after that occurred. It was an intense moment for the commander in chief of the United States of America. And I was in almost every meeting with the president in the hours and days that followed. Countless hours with the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the heads of our intelligence community, and the President was in front of and on top of it all, asking questions and requiring that America's military and intelligence community and diplomatic community would figure out and know how many people were dead, how many are Americans, how many hostages, is the situation stable. He was in front of it all, coordinating and directing leaders who are in charge of America's national security, not to mention our allies around the globe. For days, and up until now, months. So the way that the president's demeanor in that report was characterized could not be more wrong on the facts and clearly politically motivated, gratuitous. And so I will say 
that when it comes to the role and responsibility of a prosecutor in a situation like that, we should expect that there would be a higher level of integrity than what we saw. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Vice President Kamala Harris in the Eisenhower Executive Office building next to the White House. It was the end of an event on a different topic, gun violence prevention, getting that question from a reporter. A Forbes article reads, a handful of Republican lawmakers are calling for the 25th Amendment to be invoked to remove President Joe Biden from office following the release of the special counsel's report Thursday that highlighted Biden's alleged memory issues and accused him of wrongly retaining classified materials while a private citizen but stopped short of criminal charges. Republican Senators Rick Scott of Florida, Mike Lee of Utah, and Josh Hawley of Missouri posted separately on X, platform formerly known as Twitter, calling for the 25th Amendment to be invoked, an amendment that would allow for Biden's cabinet to remove him from office if the vice president and a majority determine he's unfit to serve. That reporting from Forbes. Ian Sam, spokesman for the White House Counsel's Office, was at today's White House briefing saying the president will soon name a high-level task force to recommend procedures that will prevent classified materials from being mishandled or inadvertently lost during presidential transitions, saying the National Archives has found that misfiling of classified materials during the transitions is a common occurrence. Ian Sam's also criticized special counsel Robert Hur's report, saying there are gratuitous and inappropriate comments about the president and the reporting on the conclusions about the mishandling of the documents by, by the media has been misleading. This is the first special counsel investigation ever that hasn't indicted anyone. Every theory was explored, but the facts and the evidence disputed them. The decision was that there was no case to be made. In that reality, we also need to talk about the environment that we are in. For the past few years, Republicans in Congress and elsewhere have been attacking prosecutors who aren't doing what Republicans want politically. They have made up claims of a two-tiered system of justice between Republicans and Democrats. They have denigrated the rule of law for political purposes. That reality creates a ton of pressure. And in that pressurized political environment, when the inevitable conclusion is that the facts and the evidence don't support any charges, you're left to wonder why this report spends time making gratuitous and inappropriate criticisms of the president. Over the past 24 hours, we've actually seen legal experts and former prosecutors come out and give their analysis. Former Attorney General Eric Holder said the report, quote, contains way too many gratuitous remarks and is flatly inconsistent with longstanding DOJ traditions. The former acting FBI director said, he had overseen many cases like this and, quote, you have, you have to have explicit evidence of willful retention of these documents, and that is just not present in this case. The former FBI general counsel, who I'll add is also, was also the lead prosecutor in the special counsel Mueller investigation, said it was, quote, exactly what you're not supposed to do, which is putting your thumb on the scale that could have political repercussions. That's the assessment of seasoned professional law enforcement officials and prosecutors with deep experience at the Department of Justice. Unfortunately, the gratuitous remarks that the former attorney general talked about have naturally caught headlines in all of your attention. They're wrong and they're inaccurate and they obscure a very simple truth that I wanna repeat one last time. Since I know it's hard to wade through 400 full pages, one, the report lays out example after example of how the president did not willfully take classified documents. The report lays out how the president did not share classified documents with anyone. The report lays out how the president did not knowingly share classified information with anyone. Ian Sams is a spokesperson for the White House Counsel's Office, also a senior advisor there, in today's White House briefing. Joining the White House Press Secretary, Queen Jean-Pierre, who also took questions about the special counsel's report and the claims within it that President Biden's memory has been failing lately. You've downplayed concerns about the president's memories in situations where he's mixed up certain things. You've said it happens and it's common. But yesterday we saw the president again have a mix up with the president of Egypt, with the president of Mexico. So 
How do you explain that? Is it not valid that voters would have these concerns? Look, what I would say is this. Um, that this is a president that has, this has had relationship uh, with world leaders for more than 40 years. He has. Uh, and at times, and I even said this yesterday, does he, has, has he, um, you know, misspoken, as many of us do. I've laid out uh, some examples of even Speaker Johnson just on, uh, on TV, on Meet the Press on Sunday, who, who said he, su he supports Iran when he meant to say he supports Israel. It happens. It truly, truly happens. Uh, in that same answer uh, that he gave, he actually gave an incredibly detailed uh, answer on the overlapping dynamics in the Middle East as he was, as he was responding uh, to the question that he received from one of your colleagues. Uh, and look, uh, I, I want to quote one more one more person as I've been quoting folks this uh, today. Uh, Yar Rosenberg at the, the Atlantic said Biden has gaff, gaff names his entire career, his entire career. It is not uncommon that he has done that, like many of us do. And he said he was he was clearly uh, and he was clearly uh, talking uh, clearly talking about Egypt uh, and named Sisi and laid out his policy and the broader issues in detail. Twitter just isn't interested in that, right? And so look. This is a president who has the experience. He's been, you've heard me say this, he's been senator for 36 years. He's been obviously pres uh, vice president for eight and now president. He has these long, long uh, relationships with leaders. I think what's important here is to remember is that when it comes to the essence of the issue, the issue at hand, he understands that and has dealt with that probably, uh, you know, better than you know, any modern day president because of the record that we have seen, because of what has presented in front of him uh, as we look at what's going on in the world, uh, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in the Middle East. The White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre, part of her daily briefing. President Biden today hosted the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz at the White House. As NBC News writes, a bilateral meeting that comes at a critical time with U.S. aid languishing in Congress as Ukraine battles Russia and as Israel continues its military offensive against Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the two leaders spoke to reporters in the Oval Office. Welcome back, all. Thank you very much for making the effort to be here. And, you know, uh, about two years ago, uh, you and I met here, and you said the United States and Germany have to act together. And uh, it was necessary together. And we've been doing that. We've got to continue to do it. And, uh, you know, uh, Congress, uh, we have to pass the national security spending package now. Our House members are being somewhat reluctant. And hopefully it's uh, more politics than real, but uh, including funding for Ukraine and uh, to help them continue to defend themselves against the brutal aggression of Russia. But uh, I want to thank you all off for your leadership from the very beginning. And you've done something no one thought could get done. You've doubled Germany's military aid to Ukraine this year, and it's really important. we got to step up and do our part now. Today, we'll also discuss the work to just that we're going to be doing together to strengthen NATO ahead of the 75th NATO summit this summer here. So you got to come back. And, uh, and also, uh, the latest developments in the Middle East, including hostage release, we have negotiations going on increase in life-saving humanitarian assistance to, to, to civilians in Gaza, Gaza Strip, and uh, preserve uh, the space for an enduring peace for a two-state solution down the road. I think it's possible. It's a lot of work, but I think we can do it. So, Olaf, thank you very, very much for being here. we got a lot to talk about. The floor is yours, Matt. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, for having the chance to continue our con the conversations we have continuously all the time. And yes, Germany and the uh, United States have to play a role to keep peace in the world. This is especially so looking at the Russian aggression against Ukraine, which is still ongoing. And uh, when we saw this ridiculous interview Putin gave shortly, we understand that he is always telling a lot of lies about the history of this war, because it's so easy to understand why he's doing it. He wants to get part of the territory of its neighbor. It's just imperialism, imperialism, and I think it is necessary that we do all our best to support Ukraine and to give them the chance to defend their country. And so I'm very happy 
that in Europe we made now decisions to give the necessary financial support to the budget, also that uh, Germany was ready to increase its uh, support with weapon delivery. And hopefully uh, the Congress, will, the House will follow you and uh, make a decision on giving the necessary support, because without the support of the United States and without the support of the European states, Ukraine will have not a chance to defend its own country. I really think that it's very good that we are working together, looking at uh, the situation in the Middle East and especially working on the two-state solution, which is necessary for a lasting peace. And uh, I'm sure that the United States and Germany are aligned intensely. We are. We are. Well, I especially want to, I'd like to add another point. The failure of the United States Congress, if it occurs, not to support Ukraine is close to criminal neglect. It is outrageous. Kissinger was right when he said, not since Napoleon has Europe not looked over his shoulder and worried about Russia until now. You and I helped put NATO together in a way it hadn't been in a long time. So much is the state, so they better step up. Thank you all very much. In the White House Oval Office, President Joe Biden and the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, they did not answer any of the reporters' shouted questions. By the way, the popping in the background was the fireplace going in the Oval Office. The Senate is continuing to work on the $95 billion foreign aid bill, money for Ukraine, Israel, Palestinian humanitarian relief, and the Indo-Pacific allies of the U.S., especially Taiwan. Associated Press writes the Senate prepared for a days-long slog to reach a final vote, and leaders had not agreed to a process to limit the debate time for the bill as Republicans remain divided on how to approach the legislation. Doubts remained about support from Republicans who earlier rejected a carefully negotiated compromise that also included border enforcement policies. And even if the legislation passes the Senate, it is expected to be more difficult to win approval in the Republican-controlled House, where Speaker Mike Johnson has been noncommittal on the aid. That's some of the reporting from the Associated Press. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer laying out what's happening. Yesterday, the Senate cleared the first major procedural hurdle to passing the National Security Supplemental. It was a good and very important first step. We now resume post-cloture debate on the motion to proceed. If we don't reach a time agreement, we will hold the next vote on the motion to proceed at approximately 7 p.m. tonight. But I hope our Republican colleagues can work with us to reach an agreement on amendments so we can move this process along. Democrats are willing to consider reasonable and fair amendments here on the floor, as we've shown on many occasions in the past three years. Nevertheless, the Senate will keep working on this bill until the job is done. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York on the Senate floor. Senator Rand Paul, Republican of Kentucky, posting, this bill sends the message to Americans that their elected officials don't care about them. I've never met any Kentuckian who says, fix the border of Ukraine before you fix our border. I'll object to anything speeding up this rotten foreign spending bill's passage. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican, also from Kentucky, spoke on the Senate floor today in favor of the bill. I said the Senate would need to do its own work to meet the demonstrated needs of our national security. The president's decisions over the past three years have directly contributed to the web of serious security challenges demanding the Senate's attention. From an embarrassing retreat from Afghanistan that emboldened terrorists and shredded credibility with our allies, to a halting response to Russian escalation that kept lethal capabilities off the front lines of Ukraine's defense, to an Iran policy that tried trading deterrence or detente. The Senate can and will continue to urge the Commander-in-Chief to do the right thing. But we also have a responsibility of our own to provide for the common defense and equip the next Commander-in-Chief with the tools 
to exercise American strength. That responsibility is in front of us right now. And addressing national security challenges with serious legislation starts with recognizing some pretty basic realities about how the world works. First, America has global interests and global responsibilities. And to the extent the President has neglected them, the Senate ignores them at the nation's peril. Second, alliances and partnerships are essential to advancing our interests. They lower the cost of keeping the peace, reduce the direct risk to America, and facilitate the commerce that drives our economy. But these alliances and partnerships rely on American leadership and American credibility. And finally, there's a growing list of adversaries who wish us harm. There's growing evidence that they're working together. And there's no doubt that they are emboldened by American weakness. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky, on the Senate floor as the Senate continues work on the $95 billion bill providing $60 billion for Ukraine and the rest for Israel, the Indo-Pacific, and Palestinian humanitarian relief. From the Washington Post, Russian President Vladimir Putin spent the first 30 minutes of his two-hour interview with former Fox News host Tucker Carlson giving a revisionist historical tirade on the founding myths of Russia and Ukraine, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and NATO expansion. President Putin also asked during the interview why the U.S. continues to arm Ukraine. Do the United States need this? What for? Thousands of miles away from your national territory. Don't you have anything better to do? You have issues on the border, issues with migration, issues with the national debt, more than $33 trillion. You have nothing better to do, so you should fight in Ukraine? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia, make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today? The Russian President Vladimir Putin, through an interpreter, just 30 seconds of the two-hour interview posted by former Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Lech Walesa, former Polish president and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, spoke today in Washington, D.C. at the Victims of Communism Museum. He famously led a workers' movement in the 1980s against the then-communist government of Poland, which was under the sphere of influence of communist Soviet Union. And he talked about why aiding Ukraine now is important. What would you tell the congressmen and senators? Why is aid to Ukraine in our interest? Why is it in our joint interest, in our common interest? I don't have to prove it to you, do I, that Russia would want to hit, strike America if it only had the strength to do it. They would maybe bypass Poland, but not America. This is the only chance, this is the unique chance when uh, the entire world is united against Russia. Uh, a United States senator cannot waste this chance. Later generations will not forgive us. We have them within grasp. All that's necessary is to be in solidarity with each other and motivate the whole world in solidarity between nations. Lech Walesa, former Polish president and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, today at the Victims of Communism Museum in Washington, D.C. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, this is Rachel from C-SPAN's podcast team. I'd like to introduce you to one of the producers here at C-SPAN, my colleague, Sean. Thanks, Rachel. If you're a fan of Washington Today, we think you'll also like our evening newsletter, Word for Word, which brings you a recap of the day's most important political and policy events delivered right to your inbox. Read about what happened on Capitol Hill and at the White House and watch video highlights featuring the day's newsmakers. Hear them word for word. 
Join our community of informed listeners and viewers. Head over to cspan.org slash connect and subscribe to Word for Word today. Thanks for listening and staying connected with Word for Word. Subscribe now at cspan.org slash connect. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. It's a free app and also wherever you find your podcasts. Story from NBC News, former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who left office as one of the few prominent Republican critics of former President Donald Trump, will run for U.S. Senate in his home state. Hogan immediately becomes the front runner for his party's nomination as possibly the only Republican in the state who could make the race to replace retiring Democratic Senator Ben Cardin competitive. In 2018, he became the first Republican governor in 64 years to win a second term. That was from NBC News. Larry Hogan announced his plans in a three-minute video posted on social media just hours before the filing deadline in this race. Fifty years ago, my father, Maryland Congressman Larry Hogan Sr., made a very tough decision. He became the first Republican to come out for the impeachment of President Nixon. He put aside party politics and his own personal considerations, and he stepped up to do the right thing for Maryland and the nation. Today, Washington is completely broken because that kind of leadership, that kind of willingness to put country over party has become far too rare. My fellow Marylanders, you know me. For eight years, we proved that the toxic politics that divide our nation need not divide our state. We overcame unprecedented challenges, cut taxes eight years in a row, balanced the budget and created a record surplus. And we did it all by finding common ground for the common good. Maryland is known as the state of middle temperament. We believe in common decency and common sense. Like the exhausted majority of Marylanders, I'm completely fed up with politics as usual. The politicians in Washington seem to be more interested in arguing than in actually getting anything done for the people they represent. Enough is enough. We can do so much better, but not if we keep electing the same kind of typical partisan politicians. Look, I don't come from the performative arts school of politics. I come from the get to work and get things done school. And I'll work with anyone who wants to do the people's business. Over eight years, just down the road from Washington, we have already shown a better path forward. And let's face it, one party alone can't fix it. We desperately need leaders willing to stand up to both parties. Leaders that appreciate that no one of us has all the answers or all the power. Because this is not just about the differences between the right and the left. This is about the difference between right and wrong. And this isn't just your typical fight between Democrats and Republicans. It's more important than that. This is a fight for Maryland and America's future. And that is a fight worth fighting. And that is why I have made the decision to run for the United States Senate not to serve one party, but to try to be part of the solution to fix our nation's broken politics and fight for Maryland. That's exactly what I did as your governor, and it's exactly how I'll serve you in the United States Senate. Let's get back to work. Larry Hogan, Republican, in a posted video. Two prominent Democrats running for the open Maryland U.S. Senate seat this year are Congressman David Trone and Prince George's County Executive Angela also Brooks. Turning to the race for president, Republican candidate Donald Trump, former president, celebrating his overwhelming victory in the Nevada caucus Thursday night. He spoke in Las Vegas. So I appreciate the uh, tremendous record that you set tonight. You set an all-time record. And I really was, it was, it was a tremendous turnout. And this, this, uh, they had lines going back. And they sort of knew who was going to win. get 98%. We wanted to get over 80, and we got 98. And also, if you remember, and last night, you know what happened last night, right? None of the above. So I'd like to congratulate none of the above. 
I was one of those none of ever aboves. I was one of them. No, I saw, I watched that last night, and they won by 44 points, none of the above. So I want to congratulate. But seriously, we have to get back. This was a great day. This was a great night. Our Supreme Court hopefully will be doing something in terms of helping our country and preserving democracy. We have to preserve our democracy. And I think they had a very, very interesting day and a very beautiful day, perhaps. I think it was really a very beautiful sight to watch. And it's the way it's supposed to be. And hopefully the decision will be a very important decision. But there's never been anything like it in the polls. We're leading everybody. We are right now. Is there any way we can call the election for next Tuesday? That's all I want. I want to call the election for next Tuesday, but we're going to, uh, we're going to make our country great again. We're going to make it great. We're going to make it greater than ever before. Republican presidential candidate and former President Donald Trump at a victory rally in Las Vegas last night. He faced only competitor Ryan Binkley, who got about 1% of the vote, as the other major candidate for the Republican presidential nomination, Nikki Haley, did not compete, did not file for the Nevada caucus. She did take part in the Nevada primary separately earlier this week, and you heard that none of these candidates was the actual winner beating out Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley was interviewed on Fox News Channel Thursday night about what's next in her campaign. If you go to New Hampshire, Iowa, Nevada happens, you lose your home state, even if you lost it by just double digits, not by 30 points, the question then becomes, what is your path to get the delegates to get the nomination? Because at that point, I mean, don't you think you would have to win your home state? I appreciate you asking that. You know, I'll tell you, it's interesting because in Iowa, they were all saying, you know, she's never going to make it through Iowa. We started at 2 percent. We ended with 20 percent. That was no small feat when we got rid of a dozen of the candidates. Then you go into New Hampshire. We got 43 percent of the vote. But what's more important, Sean, is you have to acknowledge the Republican incumbent did not get 43 percent of the vote. That's alarm bells. Then you go into Nevada. I mean, look, we were told months ago that this was a sham. The GOP chair, he's under indictment. He worked with Trump. They created these caucuses. It's written about in news reports. You can write, look it, look it up on the internet. They planned this thing in the caucus. They said that we had to pay 55000 if we wanted to be in the caucus with Trump. And so, you know, Nevada didn't mean anything. South Carolina, we're going to work it hard. We're going to bring it in. But I'm telling you, we better pay attention. Look at what we lost. You've got Trump paying $50 million in legal fees from his campaign donations. You've got an RNC that's broke. How do you beat Biden with that? You can't. Nikki Haley, former South Carolina governor and Republican presidential candidate, interviewed on Fox News Channel Thursday night. A Reuters article about her campaign reads, despite her performance to date and no sign of a clear path to overtaking the former president in the race, some donors are continuing to bankroll her. During a two-day swing through California this week, she raked in $1.7 million, according to her campaign. The financial spigots remain open in part because donors believe Donald Trump's multiple criminal cases could yet end up pushing him out of the race, according to interviews with around a dozen donors, fundraisers, and advisors to donors. That reporting from Reuters. Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson suspended her campaign this week. She got 4 percent of the vote in the New Hampshire primary and then 2 percent in the South Carolina primary. She posted a video on Wednesday. I read a quote the other day that said that sunsets are proof that endings can be beautiful, too. And so today, even though it is time to suspend my campaign for the presidency, I do want to see the beauty. And I want all of you who so incredibly supported me on this journey as donors, as supporters, as team and as volunteers to see the beauty, too. There is so much for us to take from this. And that includes knowing that we laid it down in ways that we should all be proud of. We spoke for those who could not speak for themselves in the society. We spoke for those whose lives are falling apart, at least indirectly because of bad public policy. We spoke of those who are struggling because of environmental crises, because of racial crises, because of criminal crises, because of economic crises. We did what we could to shed some light in some very darkened times. For that, I will always be so grateful. Author Marianne Williamson, a video posted Wednesday, now a former 
Democratic presidential candidate. The other prominent challenger to President Biden for the Democratic presidential nomination, Congressman Dean Phillips of Minnesota, posting today, I'm a well-meaning 55-year-old man with a good memory who will defeat the ill-meaning 77-year-old man with a bad memory this November. Wall Street today, the Dow down 54, NASDAQ up 196, S&P up 28. Story from NBC News, Super Bowl 58 will feature a tough defensive scheme that has nothing to do with football. This one is about stopping drones. The NFL and federal law enforcement officials are taking a hard line Sunday to keep players and fans safe from unauthorized drones at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas, where the Kansas City Chiefs will play the San Francisco 49ers. Unapproved drone flights have become a persistent problem for the NFL, as well as for other sports leagues and large public gatherings. The NFL said there were about 2,500 drone incursions near stadiums during the 2022-23 season, an increase of about 90% from a year earlier. That was from NBC News. The Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas talked about this and security at the Super Bowl in general at a news conference in Las Vegas on Wednesday. Last week... Anyone watching the Ravens Chiefs AFC Championship game would have noticed an unexpected and unexplained administrative timeout about halfway through the first quarter, delaying the game for several minutes. The timeout was called by security officials at MNT Bank Stadium in Baltimore when an unidentified drone flew over the stadium. It does not require much imagination to understand the significant threat such an incident could pose. What happened in Baltimore underscores the vital importance of the mission. 385 men and women from the Department of Homeland Security are carrying out here in Las Vegas this week. They and all of us in the department, alongside our federal, state, and local partners, are working to ensure that the 65,000 people attending Super Bowl 58 and the millions of people gathering together and enjoying the game across the country are all safe. Our extraordinary workforce is bringing our many resources and skills to bear to do just that. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas at a news conference in Las Vegas on Wednesday. He and NFL officials say there are no known credible threats ahead of Super Bowl 58. It's the first time Las Vegas is hosting the Super Bowl and they expect 300,000 visitors to the city. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. It's free, and get the stories in the headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Subscribe at cspan.org connect. Have a good night and weekend. <music>